know it's difficult to start anything after after such movie but we have to start my name is Jan Linke I'm attorney at law I am managing partner in Linke Kulitsky law firm and I am honored to be moderator of this panel uh, the topic of panel is corporate social responsibility in a real crisis situation uh, many companies have actively helped and continue uh, help uh, to Ukrainian citizens affected by the war and uh, this is a broad topic uh, we'll discuss it on today's panel uh, along with our guests uh, I am sure that uh, it will be um, it will be constructive and honest discussion regarding this significant matter uh, please let me let me introduce our amazing panelists Bogdan Kucharski CEO of BP Poland welcome Mr. Jarosław Romanchuk managing partner Eukon Legal Group um, Ms. Yevgenia Bodnia project manager cabinet of ministers of Ukraine uh, Aleksandra Robaszkiewicz head of corporate communications and CSR Little Poland, uh, Olga Nosova, co-founder National Restaurants Association of Ukraine, and Mr. Łukasz Lasek, branch director Rzeszów Sus Logistics. So let's start from uh, the first uh, question to uh, Ms. Evgenia. Uh, we all know about the fact that business is joining to help uh, Ukraine in times of crisis and armed conflict. Uh, please tell us what is the real value of, of this help? Uh, to what extent is it felt considering the enormity and destruction and needs? Thank you, Jan. Um, thank you for, first of all, inviting me here to the panel discussion. It's my pleasure to share some insights on how business in Ukraine is working in the wartime. So maybe to start from the uh, numbers, um, to understand the scale of the damages that uh, the economy of Ukraine and the business uh, have. So uh, the World Bank, uh, in his um, uh, need assessment uh, that was reported in uh, June 1st, 2022nd year, uh, just a couple of months, like almost a half a year ago, actually, uh, said that uh, the total need for the recovery of Ukraine uh, is around 750 billion of um, USD dollars. Um, and it's actually dated on June, I need to stress it, uh, because right now the damage is much, much higher due to the massive rockets attack to the energy infrastructure. And the business actually is suffering uh, the most as well um, because the uh, production is stopping due to the electricity and um, the massive attack, recent massive attack has a huge impact on uh, the production in all the sectors, starting from culture, uh, finishing with agriculture and energy sector. Uh, just to give an example, in agriculture sector, um, some... Um, uh, chicken farms that cannot operate because all of the systems are uh, automated and they are all dependent on electricity. It means that it's additional cost to the businesses uh, to keep the business going, uh, but it also means that it's raising the prices for the uh, um, for the product. So we actually uh, answer into your question. We really cannot uh, overestimate the help for the business and the, and the business that is doing the job. Uh, why? Because first of all, it's taxes that is going into local budget and the national budget. Keeping business work and keeping business operated during the war time, really a need for economy. Despite all the factors that, uh, despite that business is helping additionally uh, for the humanitarian purposes for, um, um, helping the government directly with their capacities. But just keeping business operated, it's already a huge value to the economy and to the government uh, and businesses is provided. Um, another point that I would like to stress here is that 
um, maybe being socially responsible businesses in Ukraine right now, it doesn't mean to, not only means to donate money to humanitarian needs or to humanitarian organizations, it also means just being functional. It means taking care of their employees. It means that it, we need to relocate your employees, take care of the families and the employees, to basically keep paying salaries it also rather, I think, a social responsibility that we can consider in the time of war economy. And I think that would be my main argument. Just to give you some numbers, uh, the European Business Association did a calculation, did um, um, an estimation, and uh, their members said that 70% of businesses is fully functional right now, 16% uh, limited their geograph geographical spread and capacity over the Ukraine, 19% um, close their businesses uh, completely, and 29 businesses don't work and won't stop working. Um, but 27% of the businesses from this um, association uh, temporarily uh, uh, terminated their work, but they want to restart it. Uh, just in terms of the salaries and coming back to the social responsibility for the employees, 63%, so basically more than half of the businesses is keep paying full salaries to the employees. In addition, 45% of the companies paying additional values and uh, added fees to the employees in terms of the extra uh, the crisis uh, situation that we have right now. So um, I really think, and I also s uh, say it not from the, uh, the position, uh, like official position, but also observing, for example, how my father is as an entrepreneur keeping the business working. They're not earning anything right now. They don't have receive any income uh, and revenue from their businesses, but they keep their workers coming to work imitate some, at least some work for them. They are buying uh, generators uh, to keep the production going and to, to be having this visuality of work, uh, which also uh, have a huge impact on mental health for employees. So I cannot stress enough how important it is for business to be functional right now, both for the economy, for the budget of Ukraine, but also for um, um, employees and uh, resistant capacity of the nation. Uh, and being responsible doesn't mean only donating to organizations and providing um, f food or uh, donating money to the army. It also means keeping and uh, caring about the employees. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bogdan Kucharski, uh, the company which you represent uh, is very active on the CSR area for years, however, what has uh, the outbreak of war changed in the context of your strategy or direction uh, of action? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so look, to be able to say what has changed, uh, I just wanted to tell you briefly how it has been before, yeah, because it's relevant as a reference point. Uh, we've been in Poland, uh, we've been active in Poland for more than 30 years now uh, in various lines of business and uh, Ever since the beginning, we have been providing help. We've been helping local individuals, local organizations, corporate social responsibility. This is part of our DNA. We, we just believe this is the right thing to do. Employees want that, yeah? And increasingly, if you want to acquire right employees, you have to be doing that, yeah? This is what they expect. This is not only about salary terms and conditions, but this is about, this is integral part of the offer. Customer wants to, yeah? I mean, customers, they can, do, of course, they always have choice. They can go here, their offers are comparable, products are very competitive. CSR and engagement in local communities can make a big difference, yeah? And then administration, governments, they also expect that. But eventually, even if they would not be expecting that, actually, we would just believe this is the right thing to do. I mean, we are here, we work here, we employ Polish employees, uh, we work with local communities. We believe that we have to give something in addition to taking something. So this has always been the case. Now, in the last 30 years, we have spent roughly $10 million on any type of customer social co 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 CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility, working with many partners, established partners. Uh, some of them are present here. Grzegorz Gruca from 
Polska Akcja Humanitarna, Polish Humanitarian Action. They have been our partners for many, many years, probably more than 20 now already. Same with uh, Spring Association, Wiosna, you would know it as Szlachetna uh, Paczka probably. We've been also supporting uh, top Tatrzańskie Ochotnicze Pogotowie Ratunkowe, Mountain Rescue Team. So none of these things have changed in recent times. Yeah? This is all based around uh, trust, relationships, know-how of professionals, Polish humanitarian action. They have been involved in all type of humanitarian crisis and help globally, including as a result of war in many, many places. So they know how to do it. They have people, they have organization, they have experience, they have relationships. And as a result of that, we have confidence in them. We know that they can do a right job. They are professionals here. One of the things we have discussed before the panel is actually this sort of element of trust in situations like this, because all of a sudden in a crisis, there are all sort of requests and opportunities popping up. As a business, I would not be able to verify that. Yeah? I don't know whether the request that somebody is making is a genuine one or not. And at this point in time, we turn to Polish Humanitarian Action and other partners because they are professional, they know people, they've been working with different people. So this has made a big difference over here. So actually, th there are many elements which are constant currently versus how things were before the war. One thing which has changed though, is actually pace and intensity. I have mentioned already we have spent $10 million on CSR activities in the first 30 years of BP in Poland. Since the outbreak of war, we have doubled that. Yeah? We have spent almost another 10 million locally in Poland. And I would not be able to actually offer that support and make sure that I, that we convince corporation to spend money if it wasn't for this long term relationship and confidence that people we are working with, they will do good use of that resources uh, and support available. So pace and intensity is the only thing which has changed. However, it's based on relationship experience and confidence. Thank you very much. Pani Aleksandra Robaszkiewicz, do Pani pytanie bardzo podobne. Uh, Robaszkiewicz, a similar question. What has changed since the outbreak of the war when it comes to your strategy, the strategy of Little Polska? Have you created special additional funds? Or maybe you have expanded uh, and added new projects. Thank you very much for inviting me here. We as a company, as Lidl Polska, we faced similar challenges after the outbreak of uh, the war. When it comes to CSR, sorry, we have similar option, actions and by the February 2022, we followed the strategy. Our charity actions are part of uh, the, um, the our policy. And right now we had an emergency board. We created it. We spent 47 million Polish slotters on humanitarian aid. And we talk about products, food, fresh water, the hygiene products, non-food aid, toys, clothes, equipment for people who became refugees. As a company, we had a few dozens of requests daily. That was a huge challenge. That was a very difficult thing to define, prioritize. We based our experience on the greatest, the biggest uh, NGOs in Poland, the most experienced ones. And as the previous speaker, we also cooperated with the uh, Polish Humanitarian Action. And that was the base for us. The first humanitarian aid left Lidl on the 27th of February. That was successful. I'm really proud of my colleagues because 
because they were working day and night. They were working on the transport. They worked with the suppliers, logistics. That was successful, and I believe it was incredible. It shows strength, and an, a, it empowered us because it was visible that we have values. The Polish Humanitarian Action, this is an organization that is really important in terms of cooperation. We also cooperate with Caritas. We extended it, uh, that cooperation, not only Caritas Poland, but also Caritas Ukraine. And we've been cooperating with Caritas for 14 years. We received support when the crisis started. We opened ourselves to the cooperation with Ukrainian business. We wanted to, we wanted, we needed some professional support. Many times we've supported local communities and local authorities, especially when it comes to the cities that were intense, that, that they, they experienced intense shelling. That was the, an experience of being sensitive and open in business that empowers and creates effectiveness. I was surprised when I saw how many my co of my colleagues were open to come to me and ask, how can we help? People from Sweden wanted to help, from Ireland wanted to help. They were asking, what, what could we do? What do you need? Of course, the problems with the supply chains were important for us. It, w it hindered our long-term strategy because our strategy is based also on, on sustainable construction. And it's difficult to make sure that we have photovoltaic panels on shops on the buildings, but we've had experience with sustainable products. And we cooperate with various international companies, and that's reflected on this common work, common cooperation. The key critical help was sending trucks with aid. We wanted to deliver food for children, for elderly people, and we are really proud that we could do it. That was a huge test for us. It was visible that people can get together when the crisis strikes. And this is a huge potential for long-term development and growth. Somebody said that experience creates personality. And yes, the war, this is a great tragedy. I wish that we have a safe world again. But I would like to say that it's a test. We can stop for a moment, and we coped with the situation, and we know that business can do something, we can mobilize each other and act. Mr. Lukas Lasek, the company which you represent, SAS Logistics, uh, offered Ukrainians a lot of services, a lot of assets, and a lot of know-how. How why it is so important and uh, why you consider such help as more effective than normal than standard uh, donations, simple giving money. Dziękuję bardzo za zaproszenie, podobnie jak przedmówcy. Ja reprezentuję jakby firmę z oddziału i z perspektywy Rzeszowa, która jest w dosyć I represent my company here in Rzeszów. We're close to the border and we were the first ones to go to our hub to headquarters. The company, I mean, the name of the company sounds as a German company, but our capital comes from Poland, and we are a family company. When it comes to decision-making path, it's shorter than usual. When we talk about the know-how and why this way of helping is important, hmm, 
No my jako firma we logistyczna można powiedzieć, z mamy na co dzień, tak? We deal with crisis every day. Przecież dwa lata do tyłu, mieliśmy, mieliśmy 2019 rok, tak? Mieliśmy trzy już teraz. Mieliśmy covid więc wszystkie COVID łańcuchy dostaw, pandemic started, supply chains zachwiane, zerwane, were disrupted, and we needed to search for new solutions and find a way to make sure that the product is delivered to Poland and other countries. The know-how and the structure of the warehouse, the flow of the material and products, the structure of the organizing of the warehouse. I'm not talking about pallets or units, but I'm talking about the whole process, process management. So the whole path ordering the product and delivering to the client. Very often we talk to the clients and clients say, we have this product, we would like to have it delivered, but we don't know how to do it. And this is what we did. We prepared the docu documentation, we prepared procedures, we prepared everything for the customs. And also we did it from for charity organizations. And as previous speakers said, we wanted to make sure that we have standards. We cooperated with a company that's responsible for the humanitarian aid globally. We have 18 offices in here, also in uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, but we also have 20, 240 sorry, offices around the globe. We talk about China, Asian countries, or American offices, and we talked to such clients who wanted to have their products delivered, and we helped them. So having the know-how, the knowledge about the documentation, it helps us and the donors to make sure that the products go to the certain location without any problems and that it goes where it's needed. We're proactive. We have our own strategy. We have our plans. We know how CSR should be organized. But still, I believe that the war was a surprise for everybody. Nobody expected that. Americans were saying that it would be possible, but nobody Nobody knew when, and I was surprised when I heard about the invasion. And I remember uh, that this was a fa Thursday. We, as a company, we spend one million zlotys on what we can do. So we had our own tracks, we paid for that, and we delivered the products where we knew it should go. We dealt with the logistics, containers, aerial transport, to make sure that the products were delivered as fast as possible and to the places where they should go. And I mean hospitals, various institutions, government institutions, authorities, NGOs. You can set various examples here. And we have, for example, today power generators. We want to send them to Ukraine. We know that the winter is coming and there are blackouts, so we have those huge power generation generators that can make sure that commercial centers or various governmental facilities can be heated and the energy can be provided. We managed to load a few dozens of pallets with warm shoes for Ukrainian soldiers. And we are not focused on delivering orders. Well, let's say that we have anything and we send it to anywhere, but we're really focused 
we are very precise. We select partners that we get products from and partners where we deliver to. So we make sure who gets the products finally. Why the know-how is important? We have examples of situations when the products from the UK were delivered and we could see the documentation, documentation and it was registered for VAT. Some NGOs had never seen that before, so they managed to open the packages and it started various problems. So I think that know-how can be useful and it needs to be used because some organizations function with and, and operate with professionals, that's true, but we try to help them to organize so that Ukraine Thank can go through Ms. the difficult Olga time. Nasova, let me remind uh, Ms. Uh, Olga Naso uh, Natsova is co-founder National Restaurants Association of Ukraine. And uh, the question is, uh, how has the restaurant business in Ukraine changed since the, since the beginning of war? And how many restaurants have started feeding people for free? If you could answer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm the only representative of Ukrainian business of various restaurants. To be honest, I have a presentation, but in Kiev uh, there are numerous blackouts. We have electricity for four hours, and then there's no electricity, that's why I don't have it here today. I wanted to say that the business is still alive, still present. Till the 24th of February, it had been developing. We had uh, 45,000 various companies and 700,000 people were working there. Every month, up to five restaurants, cafes, we're open. So it means that we had cities with a dense population of restaurants. They were well designed, awarded, our chefs participated in international competitions. That was a profitable business. A restaurant or a cafe in Kiev or Kharkiv could, had, could have around 10,000 euro of income, of revenue, and it means that it was really profitable. Some of them managed to get the revenue of 60 to 80,000 euros monthly, but then suddenly it stopped on the 24th of February. Nobody worked on that day. On the 25th of February, people started working, even though it was dangerous. Despite all the threats and risks, restaurants' owners wanted to open the facilities. It was difficult to obtain products to cook. Consulting companies, construction companies, they cannot work during uh, the war time because they're not needed. But food is needed during the war. People need simple things, food, heat. Even money is not that important. You, if you have money but you cannot buy anything, you don't need that. So it wasn't a strategy. This is what happened. We had various volunteers, active volunteers, who decided to open restaurants. More than a half of restaurants decided to cook food and give it to people who needed food. 
I was surprised. I know that everybody wants to earn money. Huge companies, restaurant owners, we want to earn money. We want to make profits. And that was surprising that people decided to give their own money to refugees, soldiers, to older people who had no possibilities. In Kiev, you couldn't buy anything. There was nothing. Uh, I was uh, in a shop on the 24th of February. I could buy everything. But then on the 25th, there was nothing. I couldn't buy meat, bread, anything. And you could go to a restaurant. It was open. They had... Uh, the food uh, ready so they could cook. And that movement of volunteers has continued since. It's still present. During the first month, it was really intense. After that month, of course, it's expensive. You need to buy new products. And huge companies such MHP were delivering products, they gave meat for free. We had farmers visiting the city and also giving the flour, let's say, 10 tons of flour that we could use. This is what we did for a month and a half. We worked for free. We wanted to survive. We wanted people to have something to eat. And I believe that business wanted to be needed to help and not to go crazy. Nobody knew what would happen. And you never know how you behave if the work starts. If you help, if you do something, if you cook, if you go somewhere, you just don't go crazy. You don't pay attention to the shelling, bombing. And right now, I can say that I'm not afraid of the alarms, rockets. I know the sounds. I know that this is not terrible. Uh, you can hear various sounds, and you know that if there's a rocket that's going to kill you, you won't hear it. If you hear the rocket, it's safe. And there were no bunkers in our district, so what could you do? We had to do something. We wanted to use the products. That's why restaurants started cooking food and help others. In the western part of Ukraine, where it was a little bit safer, restaurants were opening. People who came there from the east of the country, they were cooking for free, simple food, a soup, potatoes, or different types of food. So the culture of cooking was set aside and we shifted to a simple uh, cuisine. And it lasted for three months. The restaurants spent all the money. Some of them went bankrupt. They had to be closed. Of course, we talk about different situations. We had chains of restaurants that were preparing around thousands of portions of food. Some restaurants could prepare, let's say, 100, but Chains of restaurants cooperated with the donors and they cooperated with international organizations. They created a system. We have a chain of restaurants, Palenita, that prepared food for older people, for the most vulnerable ones. 
There were people working to prepare the food. It was difficult. It was difficult to find workers. Many people left the country, so people were needed, employees were needed. People worked to get the food. Sometimes we experienced such situations that restaurants had no money, but a person could go there and work to get the food. We wanted to support such networks. The aid of international donors was needed, and also local support was needed. The restaurants didn't receive that huge support because it seemed that there were more important things, but business started working and helping refugees and citizens of Ukraine. We used national funds, and I believe that we want to sustain that system. During the summer, such restaurants, charity restaurants were working, and some of them have been working since the out outbreak of the war. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Jaroslav uh, Romanchuk, you have a very wide perspective on the uh, area of helping to Ukrainian citizens uh, by Polish business. Uh, please, from your perspective, what did businesses or activities look like uh, in Poland after the outbreak of, of the world, having in mind your experience? Uh, as president of association, yes, of of, uh, of business Polish and Ukrainian. Dziękuję panie mecenasie. Ja spróbuję wypowiedzieć się w języku ukraińskim. Tak, tak będzie szybciej, tak będzie skażemy lepiej. Jak moja przedstawa, ja nazywam się Jarosław Romanczuk, adwokat i kierujący partnerem w Warszawie i Kijowie z 2006 roku. Na dzisiejszy dzień mamy największą jurysdykcję kompanii polsko-ukraińskiej. Ja przedstawiam sekcję ukraińską we are a member of the, of the Association of Polish Businesses in Ukraine. Uh, actually, all SMEs in Poland are our clients. Half of the clients in Kiev, Kiev are companies with foreign capital. I'm just saying that in order to move on to the situation um, connected with CSR. Later, I will uh, tell you, I will present some examples. Since the beginning of the war, mm, I will talk uh, from my own perspective. So since the outbreak, the business, business had three main challenges. <coughs> Uh, um, so we, we should talk about three perspectives, the outbreak of the work, during the work, and plans for future. Most clients we talk to have plans for the future. The plan is go back and start working in Ukraine. What happened during the war? From my own experience, again, on the 23rd of February at 6.45 p.m., together with one of the big Polish investors, we took off from uh, Borispol Airport to Tbilisi in order to take part in a meeting to uh, lead to the acquisition of uh, commercial rights. And at night, I received an official information from my colleague that the, the war would start. And so I didn't go to sleep um, for the rest of the night. And my task was was to, uh, was to let my employees know. On the one hand, I had this information. On the other hand, I couldn't be sure it would happen. What I'm saying is that we were preparing for that. We did a lot. We had done a lot because we understood the situation. But uh, in my heart, I really didn't believe something like that would happen in the 21st century. So the first thing was shock caused by the outbreak of the war, by the occupation. Shock caused by the fact that the occupiers came into the center of Kiev. And I think that was the biggest challenge. 
he should forever. be challenged as a more and the fact that the fight started from the Belarusian side. Uh, so at the first stage, uh, moral support of families and uh, employees was needed. It was the first most important task. The next task, which was to relocate employees and their families from the hot points where the war was already taking place and at the first stage could we we could start thinking about business about own business and the business of our clients it was a three-stage approach my own experience shock i experience although i am a, a lawyer a barrister i think i am a strong person i must say that for three days I was really affected by that shock. On the fourth day, it uh, left me a little, and I started focusing on more practical things. The problem for me was, was not only to go from Tbilisi to Kyiv, but also from go from Tbilisi to Warsaw. It was Thursday, and the first flight from Tbilisi to Warsaw was on Saturday. Uh, through my colleagues, lawyers, we managed to find information uh, that there was flight from Kutaishi to Gdańsk. So I got a ticket for that, and from Gdańsk I went to Warsaw during that time. All that time I talked to my employees. I talked to my clients. Um, the second task was to provide humanitarian aid to provide aid which as part of the association of Ukrainian business in Polish we were lucky because some clients had their, had their warehouses in Helm, for example. And on the 25th of February, thanks to support and communication with a, um, parliamentarian um, from Ukraine, we got the first delivery of humanitarian aid. Uh, there was a lot of support from international organizations. The, the first challenge was to how to formalize legally delivering of aid. We had problems with Polish border services. We didn't have any such experience. Nobody was prepared for that. So maybe I shouldn't even talk about it aloud, but I think most of you understand that the first days, during the first days, the humanitarian aid, well, I can't confirm it here. Formally, only after a few days we managed to work out a formal mechanism to formalize uh, all the documents. And the only issue we weren't able to solve was the questions about double destination. Uh, because it's really strictly regulated in Poland and delivering of such products can be managed only by a company which has a concession. Then it was taken over by the state, by the ministry, and the mechanism was worked out. But it's very interesting when we talk about CSR, Let's remember that until the outbreak of the war, most of such CSR looked according to some principles, to some regulations. Let's remember EU directives which obliged companies to implement those standards. Uh, actually, during the war, and uh, well, Ukraine is an example, we actually saw how CSR looked. Nobody took into account any guidelines, principles, regulations. 
Nobody looked at legal matters, but everybody with their employees tried to help and work. I don't know any company I work with which uh, wouldn't care for their business, which wouldn't talk to local people, local authorities, which wouldn't pursue that activity. It's an example of CSR in extreme conditions. When we were naturally able to organize ourselves, now, what effects are there for the future? Uh, looking at our experience of working in the Ukrainian office, we can assume that cooperation of companies with foreign capital has decreased over the first month by 10 to 20%. Now it's about 60%. What I mean is the active business activity. We see this communication from the point of view of work, work for the future. Uh, and I'm talking about the fact that, well, I'm trying to defend the legal industry. We heard that it's not necessary, but actually our clients are also a big restaurants. Uh, actually, most of them communicated with us because what you've mentioned, which is giving out some food products, preparing dishes and giving them out free of charge, it requires some legal grounding. So there should be uh, the right balance, uh, there are taxes involved. So everybody that worked on those mechanisms from the very beginning, we've managed to work out how it should work with tax services. So now these restaurants can work like this. What we see now is that a lot of companies have gone bankrupt because they didn't work out this mechanism for the future. There are also other reasons, other causes of this situation of going into liquidation. But to sum up, what I can say is that the biggest problem for Ukrainian business is human resources, human capital. How do we motivate them? How do we encourage the employees who went abroad to come back? I think it's the biggest challenge when it comes to CSR for the future. Thank you. From perspective of Cabinet of the Ministers of Ukraine, um, how, uh, how has your relationship with business in Ukraine changed since the outbreak of the war and as it, is, uh, as it currently stands? Just to make a clarification, maybe not from the position of the Cabinet of Ministers, but the Reformed Lever Office as an advisory uh, consultancy to the government uh, of Ukraine. Um, uh, I just want to share maybe my personal as well observations uh, on this topic. Um, the government actually took a really huge role in helping businesses of Ukraine to relocate from the most um, hot topics of the hostilities in regions and also in the regions that are right now temporarily occupied. Uh, the government, uh, in, in the head of the Ministry of Economy, they organized and also my colleague participated in this process from the reform support team of the Ministry of Economy in developing the schemes how the businesses might be relocated to the more safe western areas in Ukraine. Uh, there is a different programs that should be uh, uh, mentioned here and I think one of them is really important is actually DIA business. It was uh, re just recently, in that last week, reported with the European Enterprise Promotion Award. Um, it's actually in a great platform uh, for the business support from the government side. Uh, here you can find all information about how government is helping businesses, uh, what are the ways um, for cooperation here. Um, and um, basically, for example, Ukrizadiznitsha is well uh, helping businesses to um, to relocate. It means that they are finding uh, capacities and new territories uh, to 
delivers the capacity from the occupied, temporary occupied territories. Uh, they're helping to find um, accommodation for the employees that as well moved. They're helping to find the new employees as well um, on the more safer zones uh, in Ukraine. So those are all happening right now. And I think that the relations with the, between the business and the government is also really strength right now. Uh, and are there um, uh, opportunities as well and how the business understands the situation, um, the government understands the situation and business is trying to help here is actually um, providing uh, opportunities for grant uh, in different areas. So there is a micro grants uh, already that is distributed um, up to 2,050,000 uh, uh, hryvnias. There is also businesses uh, business opportunities for micro grants for de developing and extending the production services for the companies up to 8 million uh, hryvnias. And there is also different types depending on your specific area of expertise. You can apply for the IT grant that is just starting. There you can apply for the startup grant. You can apply for the IT industry grant. You can apply for the garden support uh, called your garden. <laughs> um, uh, opportunities. So there is a lot of plenty of opportunities here. Uh, also, I think that the government is doing a great job right now as well in terms of uh, supporting IDPs, which is also an important part of social responsibilities of employees and helping actually to provide this. Uh, because uh, we cannot uh, forget that uh, we, do we don't have war since uh, February 24th. We have uh, war since uh, 2014 and uh, p uh, myself being from Donetsk as well, I um, faced it uh, myself actually, as well as a lot of IDPs. Um, but uh, when I also was working with the um, Danish Refugee Council, we've been promoting a lot to hire IDPs um, by Ukrainian business. And uh, we have a great scheme for that. Uh, the government is actually compensating the taxes uh, that this employee, uh, employer is paying. Uh, for the for hiring IDPs, and I think it's a great initiative that it started even before, uh, since 2014, invasion, Russian invasion to Ukraine. Um, so I think that's uh, main points for um, uh, the businesses. Um, I also maybe would like to strengthen that how businesses participating in decision-making process in Ukraine as uh, the government right now developing uh, the um, reform um, uh, uh, recovery plan for Ukraine uh, since April. The active work was done um, with the expert community, with the businesses as well, and we've received a lot of feedbacks and recommendations from the business association as well in different sectors. We have 24 uh, working groups, starting from the energy, uh, infrastructure, and economy as well, and we have a lot of business associations uh, who provided their comments and feedbacks. Um, so that's actually a mutual project. Uh, project together. Um, and maybe um, to conclude, I would like to say that we really need private businesses uh, ongoing for the recovery. This would be uh, the basis as well, because right now we indeed, Ukraine needs microfinancial assistance. And actually, as it's claimed, we need 38 billion uh, euro. Um, for the uh, re just just right now for the microfinancial assistance this year, but uh, and it all comes from uh, uh, international financial institutions. We know uh, international partners, organization, the government of um, foreign countries. But we really need private businesses and private investments, and for that we really need to develop um, a, a schemes how we will make sure that the, uh, the funding is provided and guaranteed uh, either by the government or international financial institutions as well for investments to come in. That will be also actually a place for people to come back and uh, to renew human capital because I cannot um, disagree with Yaroslav uh, about this huge problem that we're right now facing to uh, make hum human capital alive in Ukraine and people coming back for the work. So business is actually the main uh, force for that uh, to do and to help um, in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bogdan Kucharski. If you could shortly tell us about two major CSR projects during this conflict and if you could tell us something about your plans for the next years, uh, if something is changing or not. 
Ja może na początek, zanim powiem o programach, to po, powiem coś z, z naszego punktu widzenia najważniejsze. I Maybe nie, nie, I share my point of view, our point of view. Our partners um, have been mentioning that. To będzie maraton. They were saying when it started, it will be a long run, a marathon. You need to pay attention to your abilities, to your capacity, that's a long-term process. At the beginning, everybody will be mobilized. We could see that. We could see that in a corporate area, private area, but then everybody gets tired, everything's normalized, and it gets more and more difficult. So our partners said that at the beginning, this is a long-term effort. Thank you for your support. We need it, but not, let's not use all the resources at the beginning. Finances, energy, and this is what happened. So what do we do? We cooperate with the Polish Humanitarian Action, and uh, we have two stages, or we had two stages of that help. First, we have provided mobility uh, for the organization. Polish Humanitarian Action created reception centers at the border, and uh, the mobility was needed for volunteers to the centers, to the hubs, and also in the region, and also the ability of transporting refugees to Poland, to other cities. After that, we created an organized convoys going to Ukraine, at the beginning, as you probably remember, it was difficult to get fuel because people started panicking in Poland. And then, after some time, for a few weeks, we had difficulties in Ukraine with fuel. So the cars could be uh, tanked in Poland, and then they should go to Ukraine. We also helped financially and we provided products uh, for the convoys that were going with the aid to Ukraine. And finally, the fourth way of helping cooperate uh, with cooperation of Polish humanitarian aid, we couldn't verify clearly that a person who wanted and such for help would need it properly, we asked uh, the organization to verify that. Probably you may know, you know the association Wiosna, and we have Szlachetna Paczka program. It's organized every year in Poland, and this association has an additional scheme in the summer, Solidarna Paczka. The scheme was similar. We had a family with certain needs, and the organization connected the people who needed help with the donors and the packages. Uh, were created, prepared, and this is how we supported 1,200 families in Poland, which means 4,000 people. And the Wiosna Association was also engaged in helping refugees to get to various places in Poland. So they supported the mobility, and they could, it, could do it because of fuel cards we provided. Mm, and people in need could buy basic things when they um, uh, reached petrol stations. When it comes to corporate help, corporate aid, it's multidimensional. To make it effective, we need two additional things. First of all, we need clients. We made sure that our clients could use their points from loyalty cards to be used for a charity, also for Polish humanitarian action, and many clients decided to do it. There are many clients who collect points just to give it to a 
to jeszcze bardziej zmaksymalizować. We managed to maximize the process. We engaged clients into a promotion activity. We had in action a campaign. If you decided to buy a coffee, one lot for that coffee was spent on humanitarian aid, and we managed to collect over one million slotters. And that money was spent on supporting help in Ukraine. This is something that that reminds our clients about the situation because it, everything's normalizing. We have business as usual and we have a new campaign. It reminds us that we need to help. No i na końcu pracownicy, and finally, our employees. Myślę, że dobra, I mentioned that at the beginning. The CSR culture ale też się samemu angażować. I nasi pracownicy się rzeczywiście mocno angażowali together, przez tym, co pracownikom daliśmy trzy dodatkowe sure dni własnego urlopu, po to, żeby mogli pomagać. Rzeczywiście ludzie z pojechały na granicę, często połączyli się z weekendem, po to, żeby pracować w tych punktach recepcyjnych w Puchu. To work in the reception centers. Our office in Krakow is close to the main train station, and the employees were preparing sandwiches. Then they were delivering the sandwiches to the train station during their working breaks, and that was a direct engagement. Of course, that's not all. Many people had individual actions. They prepared packages, convoys. They were hosting Ukrainians in their own homes. And I think all that is needed. We need to cooperate and support people and engage our partners and employees. Thank you very much. Alexandra, a similar question. If you could say a little bit more about the perspective of Leading Polska, and if you could describe two projects that you had, and if you could say a little bit more about what's going to happen after the war, because we know that when the war finishes, the help will be needed. Yes, of Szanowni Państwo, ladies and gentlemen, tych projektów było niezwykle dużo, ponieważ my przekazaliśmy wesołe wsparcie finansowe organizacjom pozarządowym i wsparcie produktowe, o którym już dzisiaj opowiadałam. Ale chciałabym skoncentrować się na tym, co teraz Actions, activities, and engage local communities and employees. Every shop, every little shop, has a point, a stand where you can donate food and products for Ukraine. We've been cooperating with various organizations for 20 years. We have good experience when it comes to such organizations. And we selected such organizations because we have similar visions and they also support other smaller organizations when it comes to organizing help. We want to continue that activity. We're really proud of the fact that the clients responded so actively and that they want to donate money, hygiene products, food, and we will continue that. What's more, we want refugees from Ukraine, Ukraine to feel safe here, to feel welcome, to be integrated with local communities. That's why we wanted to make sure that going shopping is as easy as possible. That's why we decided to change the layout of uh, the automatic cashing stands 
So that, uh, that simple activity, when you go to do the shopping, is as easy as possible. Um, now we also created a voice messages in Ukrainian, and the videos that we create, ads that we create, are also translated into Ukrainian, so that everybody can understand the message, and that people can learn Polish easily. Those are basic things that we did, inclusive activities that we undertook. And we want to make sure that the community that enriches our population feels welcome. We're also a, an employer. And this is the role of retail that I see. We are based on human capital. Every year, we have, let's say, 1,000 to 1,500 new jobs at Lidl. And we have, we employ people who are refugees. They get employment, they have a valuable job, and every colleague gets a tool a free tool that enables them to learn Polish, and that tool can be given to the members of their families so that they can adapt to the situation, that they can feel comfortable. And this is our role. Being a good employer for those people means that it gives this feeling of normality. We also provide some incentives, benefits like medical care, uh, social group insurance, and it means that those people are independent again. They don't have to base their lives on social support, but they get their dignity back. And we can see that, and we see that this is our role, uh, the role of a sector, and it's not only our company, but the whole industry. Long term, I think that we're open to diversity and inclusion, and we know that it's good for our company. It empowers us, it teaches us being open and how to communicate with people from a different country, people who are fr from a different place but are close to us. And the situation in Ukraine is a challenge for Europe, for the whole world. Being a good employer, having this long-term perspective, this is the most important for us and the possibility to grow. Łukasz, a quick question. You have a long operational experience. If you could point to the areas that need to be improved so that the help is effective. Thank you very much. Thank you for that recognition. Answering to your question, let me give you an example. The images live the longest, so that will be short, but I hope you remember it. When the war started, the problem started. There were no products, the supply chains were disrupted. We needed to relocate the employees. And additional thing. This is what was said before. People want to help everybody at the beginning. They want to donate everything. So the main problem was that one organization was searching for a simple product, diapers, for babies. They were searching through the whole country, shops, producers, organizations. But 50 kilometers away, in the warehouse, there was a different organization organization having three trucks of diapers and that was the result some were searching and some had too much when we think about process management what can be improved we should use the, that experience 
And we think about three or four main points. First, organizations should cooperate together, exchange knowledge, exchange information, exchange stock information. Because maybe one of them has something that can be shared. The other thing. NGOs, Caritas, Polish Humanitarian Action, or other associations like Podskrzydłe Manioła, they acted intensively. They searched for accommodation, uh, free food. It's good to use that know-how, but use also the know-how of the logistic operators. We as a company, when it comes to logistics, we our know-how is above average when it comes to product delivery product trade, documentation, the flow of the product. We know what needs to be done, what kind of documents need to be prepared so that this special code for humanitarian aid is printed and the car can go and doesn't have to wait in the queue and goes to Ukraine quickly. We know how to deliver that to Kiev or to the eastern part of Ukraine. We know how to make sure that the product <coughs> is divided into smaller parts and delivered in the smaller cars. I think that this knowledge should be used. And I heard when I studied that if you don't know the law, it doesn't mean you shouldn't abide it. So that's the thing. We need to make sure that we motivate people to help. I think that this first euphoric moment of eagerness to help ended, maybe before Christmas, we'll see it again. Those are small things. Employees engagement. We have 2,000 employees in Poland. They're willing to help. They're engaged when it comes to donating money. Simple things, as I said. We employ people from various parts of the world, not only Ukraine. Our institution is flexible. Our company communicates using various languages. We open possibilities for people from the Eastern Europe, uh, other countries. We have Chinese employees, European employees. But What's the most important is the security of employees, the possibility to develop, and this corporate responsibility. It's not social media, but this local responsibility. When we manage our offices, we know the problems of our employees. We know their challenges, we know what they want to do, we know who they want to help, what organization they want to support. And as we operate here in Rzeszów, we're the closest to the conflict, I believe, it means that we need to take over the responsibility of communicating, making this process, the flow of the pro uh, products fluent, smooth. And I believe that we cope with that really good. Just to conclude, it's important to use the know-how, to exchange information, it's important to help each other and search for solutions. I always say that the most important is not to search for problems, but to search for solutions. This way we can all be satisfied.
chciałbym, żeby organizacje użytku publicznego, no like NGOs, local authorities, też się bardzo mocno zaangażowały, tak? Chociażby w Rzeszowie, tak? Był punkt that are really, really engaged. Tylko jak się później okazało, że tych produktów było bardzo they dużo, were collecting products, there were many products, and at the beginning volunteers were sorting the products, but they couldn't deliver it. Because Ukrainian cars came to Poland empty, there was no fuel, so they couldn't go back to Ukraine. So they could go to Lviv, let's say, but no further. Managing the flow of the product, allocation of the product, systems, coordinating all the actions and working together with institutions, public institutions, our clients, this is what counts. Our clients said, no problem, we can give you a car, a truck of the product, but you have to organize it somehow. Thank you very much. If you could shortly tell us how today restaurant business operates during blackout in Kyiv, for example. How they, uh, how they do it? Uh, well, CSR in Ukraine is quite strange now because already now, now nobody gives out food free of charge. It's only now restaurants which have contracts with military organizations, they do. However, restaurants became or have become some social centers. Just imagine the situation. There is no power supply for four or five hours during the day. Most factories have both generators, power generators. The whole region is dark, no, nothing functions. And in the middle of that, there is a cafe or a restaurant which has a generator. And this is where people gather. It's the point of resistance, as we call it. This is a place where they can talk, they can sit in light, they can charge their electronic devices. Now, when restaurants don't give out food anymore, they have shifted their uh, interest towards people in the form of power supply. These are places where people can feel like human beings. The facilities, the places which open in these strange times is a signal for them that normal life starts. I've been to Bucha recently and uh, one, uh, one woman, one young woman uh, opened a cafe there. So people from Bucha go to that place, from Bucha go to that place, they buy something, anything, and they tell her, oh my God, it's so great that you have opened this place. And in other places where some factories were damaged or destroyed, now they are opened again and people who stay there see that peace is coming back. And they are happy to buy anything. People are grateful to cafes and restaurants which gave them food before. Now they are places where people can feel like human beings again. Uh, also, so I'd like to add that during military operations at war, um, nearly 29% of all restaurants uh, and cafes closed. At first it was half of restaurants, now they open again. And the ones which open now are mainly the ones which are located in basements. Some pubs, bars, etc. have received certificates that they can also function as shelters. They can function during um, airstrike alarm. So even if there is no power supply during such times, they can still sell alcohol or sandwiches. Uh, we even have something that is called menu at candlelight, uh, which means that uh, you can eat some cheese or ham or salads. A lot of people now eat salads. Uh, although vegetables are expensive, but this is a place where you can prepare this kind of dishes without power supply. Uh, chefs, cooks can make desserts without power supply. I don't know how they store this product so that they don't go bad. 
they probably smoke meat so that it doesn't go bad. So menu, menu at the candlelight is something that helps restaurants to survive, make money, and do something nice for people. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jaroslav Romantic, last question, please. Uh, uh, tell us shortly, in which areas, in your opinion, can business and CSR activities help in a special way? What is the most important area? Thank I think it's difficult to say, but the part which is connected to CSR for employees, maybe also for clients, has become one of the most important. Let me just say, for example, us, we, uh, by we I mean Polish business in Ukraine and Ukrainian business in Poland, we cooperated through our organizations, uh, we only send to administra administration, uh, military units, it was one part. Another part is that a lot of employees from Polish or Ukrainian companies are conscripted. Another level is the help to own employees who are conscripted. And the third level is the families, either own families or employees' families. So uh, work with, uh, with a natural person, with an employee, with a client, is uh, the biggest indicator of CSR, as the war has shown. For example, how did we motivate our uh, clients to pay on time for our services? We declared that 5% on a uh, sum that would be paid on time would be transferred or would be dedicated to humanitarian aid. And let me tell you, it works. Uh, it sounds like a simple offer. We talked about it for a long time, whether it was worth it, but it turns out that it works. Another thing at the end, because I can see that we are running out of time, but I wanted to share a problem from the perspective of CSR. We have conscripted people, uh, not only barristers, but also partners. So the challenges that refer to everyone, to the state and to every family, every entrepreneur, is the social adaptation uh, back into society of those people who will come back from war, from the front. Just look at how each of us uh, to a smaller or bigger, bigger extent suffers from or because of this war. And how are our soldiers going to live later? They were never professional soldiers. What are they going through? What is their mental state? What kind of distorted sense of justice are they going to have? This is going to be the biggest challenge. I've been thinking about it, and no country in the EU has such experience. It seems to me that the only person, the, the only country that, ha that can give us um, uh, relevant experience is the U.S., because only they have had such experience. But this problem has to be solved now, because when this war ends, and I'm sure it will be ended with victory, and that it will happen as soon as possible, it can happen anytime. We can't predict it. So the problem is not only the state, uh, of the state, it's also a problem of every business, uh, a problem that refers to every manager. Uh, let's do some up. Our values and the values of our legal company, law firm, and this is something we declared four years ago already. Uh, we focused on the goals of uh, sustainable development suggested by the UN. I think these are very important values, and the war has shown that these values 
are worth promoting. Thank many you. Thanks. Uh, many thanks for all panelists, many thanks for audience, many thanks for all people who organized this uh, conference. And special thanks for each business who supports Ukraine in this horrible time. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be moderator of this panel.